Welcome to the College of Education 10-Minute Research Break, a podcast devoted to highlighting research by Illinois State University's College of Education faculty, staff, and students. So grab a cup of coffee, get comfortable, and take a break with us. Hi, I'm Tricia Class. Today I'm talking with Mark Zablonki, professor in the Department of Special Education. He teaches courses related to diverse learners, collaboration and teaching exceptional and diverse learners, and measuring student academic and social behaviors. The article we'll discuss today looks at ways that schools can help reduce the school-to-prison pipeline for students. Welcome, Mark. Thanks for talking with me. Thank you, Tricia, for having me. Your article introduces readers to a paradox and the effort to create safe schools. These schools, in turn, have exacerbated problems for some youth with disciplinary problems. Can you discuss this more depth? I think the link to this idea of schools using harsh disciplinary practices can be attributed to zero-tolerance policies, Mm -hmm. which started in the 80s with Ronald Reagan and drug smugglers. And then in response to school shootings in the 1990s, more school districts started to take this zero tolerance approach. President Clinton in 1993 signed the Gun-Free Schools Act, which said that under the zero tolerance policy, students who bring a gun, a weapon, or have drugs to school can be suspended or expelled for up to a year. But what's actually happened and what some of the research is showing is that a lot of schools have taken these zero tolerance policies, which were meant to address really serious problems, and have been applying them to less serious situations, like kids maybe talking back, disrespect. And in the process, a lot of students have been unfairly disciplined. And many of those students are students of color and students with disabilities. So for me and for the field I work with, kids with disabilities, to find out that you know, kids with disabilities, especially kids with emotional and behavior disorders, are being suspended at much higher rates, even though the IDEA provides them with protections, is pretty disturbing. And kids that we work with typically need more services that are provided in school, mental health services, special education services. So by using the zero tolerance policies to push kids out, we're in effect doing them a disservice because we're not providing them with services that they need. So, in effect, students that need the most help are being put out of school. So, that's the basic idea of it. And also through these zero tolerance policy schools have started to refer kids to police authorities for for fighting or for situations that schools used to handle Mm in-house, which in turn theoretically leads kids to be more involved with the juvenile justice system or the vicious circle. That's the basic idea. And that's that school-to-prison pipeline. Right. So kids, if they're suspended from school, either through a police referral or through being out in the community where they're at, they're more exposed to at, you know, risk factors in the community that might lead them to get into trouble, that's the idea behind it. Okay, and the schools are contributing to the problem. Of course, it's a much deeper problem than that, I think. But you do discuss one way for schools to rethink how they address these behavioral problems, and you talk about effective staff development. Can you describe this three-tier staff development model that you propose? Staff development model is kind of patterned or adapted from the public health model that came out in the 1960s. And special education initiatives have been using this pyramid three-tier model in response to intervention, RTI, um, positive behavior intervention supports. So Simone Gonsolin, one of the authors who has a wealth of experience, took this model and said, well, why don't we look at how we can apply this to staff development? So what we have is you know, a pyramid with three tiers. The first tier is usually this universal tier. And one of the things we talk about is that at this universal tier, the focus would be on connecting school staff to the community. Uh, one idea we talk about is creating like a school-based council of different stakeholders at the school. It could be teachers, administrators, paraprofessionals, whoever would be interested, school resource officers. And then hold meetings with community stakeholders to determine available resources. So it's more of a wraparound approach, giving staff tools that they can use to pull different resources in from the community to, to help kids with behavioral challenges. So staff would be trained at this level and identifying Students with behavioral challenges who might benefit from school and community-based interventions. Staff development will focus on proactively preventing problem behavior. So having teachers look for sort of these triggers and try to intervene before a situation becomes more serious than it needs to be. Also, at the schools are encouraged to develop some sort of school-wide behavior plan. It could look something like a positive behavior intervention support, but that's developmentally appropriate and culturally relevant to the students that they're serving. Then at Tier 2, it's a little bit more intensive where school personnel might implement support plans for students who are not responding to these normal school-based behavioral interventions. And at this point, staff development in social skills training for an identified you know, some key stakeholders that work with students be appropriate. Counseling strategies, teaching 
again, key staff, maybe on de-escalation techniques, training in cognitive behavioral interventions, and just in general, understanding behavioral characteristics of students with disabilities. Because oftentimes we see a disconnect between students' behavior, which is not meant to be maybe disrespectful, but mis- being misinterpreted because of the disconnect there. And then the third tier is just more of an oversight, maybe to involve a crisis team. Schools should have a crisis team to develop you know, with any potentially dangerous situations, not just that, but maybe you know, school fights or if there's a gang fight that might happen. It would also sort of be an oversight for the tier one and two and to kind of make sure that those uh, supports that are in place at those tiers are working properly and people are putting them into place and then communicate and try to fix problems. So it's a crisis team and oversight. You note in the article that Denver has actually implemented this three-year plan. What were either some key characteristics of their plans? One, one key characteristic is they've really taken a conscious effort to change school culture to reflect high expectations for all of their students, to focus on student empowerment, to focus on culturally relevant and child developmentally um, relevant practices um, in both academics and behavior. And from this, they've got a set of guiding principles that address student discipline and school safety that are communicated to all staff. So all staff are trained in how to follow these principles. And another strategy related to that um, is to replace school suspension and exclusion practices with other strategies such as restorative justice, where say if a fight breaks out, somebody would be trained to have and sit down and have the students face each other, talk it out, maybe apologize to one another, or the student maybe vandalizes something to have that student go back and fix whatever that they've actually broken rather than putting them out of school. And through that, they found that there's been a huge decrease in both fights and then referrals to police have dropped by 60%, according to a couple of studies that have been done. I think the evidence is still coming in. They're trying to determine you know, where it's working, what other um, things need to be fixed. But they've probably taken the tiered model in a sense and have actually put it into place. Could you share some of the research on this support group, especially in the academic role of a school resource officer? School resource officers have increased dramatically in the past 10 years. They've actually had their own conference. They have their own journal. And quite often they are the ones who would be the first responders to say a fight or to something that might break out into the school. And what has been happening is a lot of the SROs also are linked to local law enforcement. So if school resource officers are referring kids out of school, then the idea here is to train or retrain some school resource officers to, instead of being enforcers, to be with counseling strategies, with academic strategies, so that they might be able to sit down and work with kids whose behavior is a result of their academic frustration. And is also to identify some of the kids in schools that might be having difficulties and to reach out to them and either be a friend or just provide some counseling services. So within this model that we propose, you know, school resource officers would play a huge role and would be included in staff development of things like the escalation techniques, academic interventions, counseling strategies. I think that they're just an important part of it. And rather than arming them. I think we're trying to give them some tools that they, they can use to actually help students. Right, especially with the recent news and yeah. asking for armed officers in the school. And I don't know if they'll get after them. But here's a different look at their role that yes. might be much yeah. more positive. Much more positive and much more focused on how can they best help the child. At the end, you provide a nice figure that outlines guiding principles for student discipline, and a lot of that's based on your findings, your research, and practice. What characteristics do you think would have the most impact on eliminating the school-to-prison pipeline? Guiding principles are adapted from research, but also from the Denver plan, and these are some of the principles that they put forth to their school staff. It's such a complex issue that I think one of the first things that might need to be done before this is to have some sort of longitudinal study to show exactly what part schools actually play in this process of quality and and societal structures. But with discipline, I think the big characteristics are that schools look at finding alternates to suspending kids. So I think some of the guiding principles like school discipline is accomplished by preventing misbehavior. So again, looking at those triggers and training staff to intervene where appropriate. With the school to prison pipeline, I think it's the part of putting kids out of school when these kids need to be in school. So finding a lot of the things we've talked about in here are focused on how do we keep these kids in school that are having these behavioral challenges. So I think, you know, it's a multifaceted approach, but I think, you know, the main characteristic is what are alternates to suspension and expulsion. I think that's probably the, the biggest factor. Thank you so much. I'm sure today's conversation will encourage others to look at your article. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. The full citation for today's article is Gonsolin, Zablocki, 
and Leone, 2012, Safe Schools, Staff Development, and the School to Prison Pipeline, found in Teacher Education and Special Education, Volume 35, Number 4, pages 309 to 319. This citation can also be found at the website coe.ilstu.edu slash research slash podcasts. Join us for future research breaks. This podcast is sponsored by Illinois State University's College of Education, where we strive to assure that all students realize the democratic ideal through our teaching, research, and service to the field of education.